So what I'd like to do, Christopher, if you don't mind, is go right to the beginning of your career. I know that you had dreams at, f at first of being an architect, but I also know that after the war in 1947, you trained at the Old Vic uh, Theatre School, which was set up by San Michel Saint-Denis in the Waterloo Road. Um, when you joined the Old Vic Theatre School in 1947, what were your ambitions? W were you then saying, I want to be a director? Did you know what you wanted to do? When I went to the Old Vic School, yes, yes I did. I think I'd, I mean, I'd, I'd had a year in, uh, in weekly rep, which I actually managed to get a job by hitchhiking around various places, and I got a job as a, uh, as a gypsy in Mara, uh, what, what, what? Oh, Mara Martin. You met Rob, Mara, Mara. Murder in the Red Barn? Uh, yes, the re yes, yes, Red Barn. Uh -huh. And I was there for a year, and then I got a place in the, at the Old Vic Theatre School. And you were interested not only in directing, but design, am I correct, at that stage? Yes, I was not as a designer, but I had qualities which were very valuable, which in actual fact put me in, in, in an advantage. I was asked by, Ma, by Percy Harris, you know, the... Yes, uh, the designer. The designer. She rang me one morning and said, look, that a great a friend of mine who's actually doing a play for, for a ballet for uh, Sadler's Wells, and he lives, I think, about 200 yards from you, uh, and the set keeps on falling down. Can you go <laughs> round and help him to get stand the, the model? And you did. So it went, down, went round, and he became a very close friend who sadly died about a fortnight ago. And who else did you meet in your encounters with Percy Harris? Anyone else? Yes, I mean, I, I, mean, I, was, uh, I was an assistant to Percy when uh, uh, Orson Welles was doing his Othello. Uh, and that was much as anything, you know, running around trying to get Orson to go to, to, to fittings and things of that nature. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, at one extraordinary time that I was sent out by Percy to get him a, a corset because he'd become very fat. Yes. <laughs> and so I did, it was in Newcastle, and I went to, uh, and I went to, a, a big store there, and then I spoke to the lady who had actually made uh, corsets and things like that. And I said, "Look, our man um, uh, Orson Welles wants you to 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 make him a, a kind of corset because he's uh, a bit fat." And she said, "Well, bring it. Uh, let him come down here." I said, "Don't be so silly. <laughs> <laughs> come to him." Yes. And she come did. to him, and she did. She came that evening, and she gave him a corset which had allowed him to. You know, pass, pass muster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what was your impression of the man himself, apart from his corset and his vast girth? Yes, I mean, he's a man of, uh, um, he was a magnificent raconteur. Mm -hmm. Yes, and some of his accounts of the work that he'd done were absolutely hysterically funny, you know that. But he'd also, he was also single-minded because he, he had a stage, uh, stage director called, um, I can't remember his name, but he used to call Wax Mustache. Wax moustache. He says, it's not working. Right, here, here. <laughs> and so one night at, uh, at the King's Head, which I think was opposite the theatre in Newcastle, where we, we had a, a meeting where and he said to Percy, uh, Percy is a woman, incidentally, mm -hmm. um, would you, uh, you know, we've got an uh, 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 opening next week, we're going next week to Nottingham, can we come and get sort this, all this scenery out? And, um, and, uh, and she said, I'm so sorry, I can't do that because um, I'm opening another play in, in another city and I can't do that. So he said, well, Chris, Chris can do it. And I said, I'm awfully sorry, I can't do that because I've got to have my first Monday at the Old Vic Theatre School and I've got to get trained to be a director. And he said, you're a schlunk. You're a, a, you're a schlunk. That's Midwest for louse. <laughs> and uh, you know, that was hor horrifying, and you know, and everybody was against me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I sent a message the next morning to Orson that uh, I would go up to London and I'll see uh, Michel Saint Denis and uh, all those people and George Devine, um, and say I could, I'll come and join you in about a fortnight. And he, Orson said. Um, if you go, he sent the message back to me. If you go now, you don't have to come back. I went. 
because I thought I was going to be, you know, I, you know, there's no point. If I was going to be in the way b bullied yes, like that by anybody, it seemed to be the wrong way of actually about working. So yeah. you, you, the man who stood up to Orson Welles, I mean, my God. Well, yeah, I've got a sack for it. Yes, well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but at the age of whatever you were, you know, 20 or whatever. Oh, 22, I think. 20, that shows a certain then. chutzpah, if I may say so. You know, well, so. It, seemed, it, seemed to be, it seemed to be entrapped, shall yeah. we say, yes. to become a person who, in actual fact, would only do what he wanted. Yes, quite. And it seemed to be that seemed to be not what I went into the theatre for at all. Well, despite being called a louse by Orson Welles, uh, <laughs> after the old Vic Fifth School, I mean, what happened to you then? Did you go straight into television, oh, uh, or did uh, you have a gap? No, no, I, I, I went into weekly rep. Uh -huh. uh, I, I was uh, I, I decided, told my father that I was not going to be an architect, which is what we'd planned. Uh, yes, I, I said, I won't earn a, any income at all for the next five years. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and what we did was, in actual fact, I asked a film producer who my father had been working with. My father worked, was a a production designer in movies. And, uh, and he, he suggested, this uh, friend of, of uh, my dad's, what you want to do is to uh, not to go and, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, work in the cinema, go and work in the theater and find out what it's like, in actual fact, to what the process is, in fact, in learning and you know, and taking risks and so on and so forth. Because he said, he said that uh, most English directors don't have a, a clue what happens to the actors. They just allow them to get on with their business and, they say, and stand there, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's what happened. So uh, I went and I got myself a, a job in a weekly rep, um, hitchhiking round, and then I was there for a year um, at Henley on Thames. And, uh, and for, you know, that following autumn, I went down to uh, uh, to, uh, to to the old Vic Theatre School. And that and was where you started training, yes. That's right, yes. And it started my training. And then I worked as uh, George Devine's uh, assistant at, at Stratford. It's very interesting that you, you consciously went into rep in order to learn how to deal with actors and direct actors. Um, Eventually, if I can steer you towards the moment when you start to work in television, I mean, I know that by 1957, you're working for Lou Grade's ATV, uh, initially as a floor manager, I think, and yes. then you graduated uh, to the role of director. And I know that one show you worked on was uh, a show that is a legend to people of my generation, Emergency Ward 10, uh, <laughs> which was the, I suppose it was the archetype of all the sort of medical soaps which we see now, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was. Uh, but after we'd, we'd done, th um, I was a floor manager, and I discovered, not discovered, I recognised that the fact that this was going to be a hit, it was going to be there, and ATV would like to go on with it, and I said, I went to Bill Ward, who ran ATV at that particular time, and I said, I want to be uh, a director, and I'd like to, to, to start directing uh, uh, emergency, you know, yes, emergency War 10. 10. And, uh, and the producer of that company, of that group, was perfectly happy about that. And he said, yes, okay, fine, you can start right now, but you're not going to get a rise. It'll do the same money, and in a year's time, we'll see what you were we're going to get paid properly. Well, let's, uh, let's see a clip of the early Christopher Morhen uh, and his work on that legendary soap, Emergency Ward 10. So if we can roll the tape. Krishna, what intrigues me, this was twice weekly, wasn't it? Was yes, it was. It, did it go live? In fact, live. Live. So That's you've right. done under enormous pressure, presumably. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. it you, know, you know, I mean, there's nothing more. Uh, in actual fact, it actually, by the time I went on to Z cars, yes. it was actually a, 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 a stimulant because they actually that marvellous music, that opening music for Z yes. cars. Yes. And actual fact, it was so exciting. When that music was playing, I was actually, you know, one was actually alert and ready for it. It was, it was marvellous. But just going back to Mosey War 10 and work like that, was it a very good training ground for a young director? Because you were having to learn, A, to work very fast. Yes. And also use lots of cameras, you know, with not a lot of preparation time, I assume. No, 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 that was all right. That's OK. You took to it naturally. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. We, 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 we got on, seemed to get on pretty well. 
I mean, in retrospect, it sounds to me a bit like weekly rep, actually, you know, except you're doing yes. two shows a week, aren't you? On yeah, that's right, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, you graduated, if that's the word, from Emergency Ward 10... That's right. Uh, ..to the BBC and directed the Z Cars, um, which was, again, a landmark series because it, it used a police format, didn't it, as a way of examining all kinds of uh, social issues. Um, I mean, looking back now, were you aware at the time that you were part of a hugely influential TV series with Z Cars? Z Cars? Oh, absolutely. It was a very, very, very beautifully produced group of people. Uh, David Rose, who's the producer, was an outstanding producer. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of very clever people were working, and very good actors, and so on and so forth. I find it immensely stimulating. Mm -hmm. And it was a very exciting time. And I also had the good fortune to, to work with uh, John Hopkins. And it was then that actually this started our long friendship. And... Uh, on occasions, you know, when we actually made uh, television ourselves. And it was very exciting. I mean, you mentioned the actors in Zed Cars. What I remember, it was this extraordinary kind of rep company of people like Stratford Johns, Frank Windsor, one James Ellis, uh, Brian Blessed, I guess, yes. amongst the cops. You know, this permanent team of actors. Yes, yes. And yeah. with, with brilliant scripts as well. Yes, very, very, very good scripts. But but not only John, but other other writers of great... Mm -hmm. you know, John uh, McGraw, I remember. John McGraw, Troy absolutely. Kennedy Martin. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Very, it, it was a ma marvellous, exciting series. Uh, and the BBC were responsible for it. And it actually created, it created a, a great s sense of faith in uh, what the BBC was doing. Because the BBC up to that time had been slightly dull. Mm -hmm. But yes, but anyway, it was. Zedcars was marvellous. Because it was live, was there an inevitable tension to it, to the actual um, shooting of it? Yes, oh yes. I mean, when that music started and it came up, you know, yeah. and it was actually marvellous. You, 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 oh my God, this is fright, this is marvellous, this is exciting. Yes. It was really lovely. When it was marvellous when it was finished and we went and had a drink afterwards. <laughs> 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 because you were, in that, you know, working live, you know, we. You know, you're taking risky things all the time. I have an image, as you say that, of Stratford Johns on late night lineup after doing a Z cast with a big fat cigar and a brandy in front of him, talking, you know, relaxing, having done the performance, as it were, that night. Yes, yes, yes. You know, relaxing as one would. Yes. Um, but you mentioned John Hopkins, who we'll come on to now. Yes. Um, obviously, I mean, an enormous influence on you. Were you aware from the beginning with John Hopkins of this enormous talent? I mean, when working on said cars, were you fairly? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. One did. So that in a way, we made a couple of little short films, mm -hmm. you know, and then we went on to uh, to make Fable. Well, let's talk about Fable because um, I don't know how many people know Fable actually, but uh, it is an extraordinary piece of work. This dates from 1965. Uh, it's a BBC play, and very briefly, what it's about: it's a satire on apartheid, and it envisages a world in which a black minority government is ruling over the white majority. So in other words, it inverts the standard South African situation and just asks the question, what if, doesn't it? I mean, it's a very daring series. Maybe before we talk about it, or not series, a play, before we talk about it, should we just have a clip? Uh, means. When obviously there is some plot against the uh, black head of state from the subversive whites. And yeah. this has obviously caused a political crisis. So if you could see the clip, please, of John Hopkins's fable directed by Christopher. Thank you. Gosh. <laughs> What's, one of the extraordinary things looking at that now is the mobility of Judy Dench's features, isn't it? The, mm. the sort of range of emotions that she can capture. I mean, do you need to direct Judy Dench, or do you just let her go, as it were? Oh, let her go. Yes. Let her off the leash. I mean, she, I mean, she finds some of it quite difficult, because in actual fact, uh, I think her mother had also been ill and uh, beforehand, mm -hmm. and that, that she was frightened of it in a strange way. But in a, uh, she was an extraordinarily gifted woman, is an extraordinarily yes. gifted woman. She really is I mean, stunning. And uh, it was a, a great pleasure working with her because in natural fact, she had deep, uh, shall we say, 
deep knowledge of herself and also of the of the human condition. Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, it, it, it was a, an honour to be able to help her, to be able to do things. She finds it quite difficult yes. because you know. Uh, because of our own family relationships and things of that nature. But in that scene alone, we should go through a mixture of, I mean, resentment, frustration, anger, guilt, joy, you know, etc., etc. A huge uh, sort of panoply of emotions. It's an extraordinary yes. performance, yes. as are the others in that, yes. in that yes. drama. Um, what is also interesting now is the sheer adventurousness of the uh, writing and the camera work. I mean, because that scene is obviously about memory, isn't it? It's about her memories of her childhood. Yes. Flooding back, yes. as it were, at, the, yes. at certain moments. I mean, was that part of the excitement of working with Hopkins? Oh, yes. It wasn't always linear, was it? It wasn't straightforward. No, 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 absolutely not. No, no, absolutely no. It wasn't just, you know, next, 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 next. Yeah. There was a kind of r r a, a running story whenever <coughs> Judy was there expressing <coughs> it. When, you know, there was a depth to everything, really. Yes. And also for the, for the others as well, because I do think that... Um, the, uh, her mother and her father and um, her brother were just, again, acted with a superlative cast, you know, really, really well. I mean, looking at, back at it, would you say a project like that would be impossible today if a writer came up to some you know, director like said, look, I've got a, what, a six-hour script in four parts that tells a story from all these different perspectives. Would it stand any chance of being screened? Well, it should. It should. But would it? I'm not sure, you know. I'm, I'm not going to introduce, shall we say, parallels, which makes me actually doubt, because mm. I think that it would be unfair, really. But I, I'm not sure whether that uh, there are executives or people running companies, in actual fact, would ta want to take the kind of risk, in actual fact, to, shall we say, to... to Make un make the experience of watching it uncomfortable. Yes, you know there were there were a, ve a very gifted group of people, uh, the controllers. Yes, very in very important because of that that relationship between the controllers and the producers and the heads of department. Yes, and the way they all they they were all. Uh, you know, in the same corridors or what, just one floor above. Yes. There was a marvellous rapport and understanding, I think. And what is interesting also from what you say is the freedom they gave to the uh, to the writer, to the producer, to the director, you know, the, and the freedom to make uh, daring television, which that is. Yes. Um, and I suspect, I mean, I'm no expert, but I would suspect that has gone now, that kind of uh, licensed risk-taking. It's well, much rarer. yes, I think nowadays they actually look for commissioners, in actual fact, outside companies, yeah, which is in a way sad. We see all the decisions were made on the fifth floor yes. of the television centre. In house, is it? In house, yes. that's right. And your cameramen in the studio or whatever it is, or on location, were people we worked with regularly. Right. It was not a, an independent, it wasn't creating. Uh, an independent success, success. No, quite. But it was because, it, in a way, it wasn't become. Uh, it uh, when when Channel Four was, shall we say, started, and they said we're going to uh, not going to uh, uh, make films ourselves. We're going to commission them. Yes. Well, Channel Four becomes a publisher in effect, doesn't it? That's yes. right. That's right. Whereas the BBC was a genuine producer, wasn't it? That's right. That's right. And a great factory of talent. Um, right. Just. Uh, Checking or you know moving on in your own career because I mean you obviously worked a lot in studios with several cameras. <coughs> you eventually moved to working on film, uh, and you worked with an extraordinary range of writers, and we'll talk about some of those in a moment. Um, <coughs> I'd like to highlight first of all Peter Nichols. Uh, you made a piece of his called *The Gorge* for television, um, which is a wonderful piece about it's a it's a family trip, isn't it? It's one of those yes. frightening. Uh, experiences of the family going out on an excursion together. Right. To the, father, the father is a bully, in a way. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Peter felt, you know, he was actually being asked to, you know, to play a, a role rather than natural factor to ha and having, shall we say, any kind of uh, respect from his family. Right. I mean, and without being unkind, you know, I'm not saying that the father was cruel in any way. That, but that Peter found it quite difficult and 
and I think he had a great deal of fun, in actual fact, putting his family, his father and his mother and aunties and cousins and yes. so on and so forth, on this, on, onto the screen. So there's a strong autobiographical flavour to the story. Yes. And what the family do, uh, basically, is go out uh, to Cheddar Gorge, didn't they? On, That's a, right. on a camping trip. And should we see a sequence in which they are... It's a totally wordless sequence in which they are coping with all the hazards of trying to uh, put up the tent and deal with all the delights of uh, alfresco eating. So can we see the scene from the gorge, please? <laughs> An English day out. Um, how much of that scene is Peter Nichols's script? How much is your direction, the improvisation of the actors? Yeah, a bit, a bit, a bit all, all together, really. I mean, he describes the, what happens. It seemed to us that the natural fact would be rather fun to, 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 to do it, in actual fact, with, a, you know, <coughs> uh, um, with the music going, which was a lovely piece of music. Uh, it seemed to be perfectly all right. Yes, and the detail came, what, in the, some of it on the spur of the moment or not? Yeah, no, yeah to a certain extent. You, you, yes, you know, to, I mean, obviously I set it up because the yes, cameras yes. weren't moving around. Therefore, we had to, each part of it we had to photograph in a, in a way so that it actually made sense, you know, and, uh, and we didn't miss activity. But it's the detail that makes it work, isn't it? Like oh, I the think so. Like sort of looking at his clipboard to check, oh, you know, I know, and I then, know, then I know. putting out his finger to work out which way the wind is blowing yeah, before getting This is actually a rather savage picture by Peter Nichols of his dad. Yes, yes you it know. is. <laughs> That's right. Yes. yes, and the various friends that they have. Um, along with Peter Nichols, another uh, great writer whom you worked with, uh, uh, both on stage and screen, was Harold Pinter. Uh, and you made a film for television with Harold Pinter, The Heat of the Day, which is um, well after the gorge, but this to me is one of the masterpieces again of, of uh, British television, and not, I think, sufficiently widely known, The Heat of the Day. Um, it's a magnificent film, and what it's about broadly is um, wartime London and a woman played by Patricia Harge, who is in fact having an affair with uh, an officer played by Michael York, who is a traitor, and uh, they're onto her, and Michael Gambon plays the rather seedy uh, spook who is assigned to track down uh, Patricia Hodge and follow her movements and work out what is going on. And in the process, he begins to fall for her. I mean, are you as, I'm sure you're as fond of it as I am. I think it's a great piece of work. Uh, I'm immensely proud of it. I'm ready to. Yeah. I've been wanting this to be shown here for some time. Yeah. <laughs> My recollection, Christopher, is when it first went out, it was, it was went out ridiculously late at night on a bank holiday or something. It went, it, it, it was, it broadcast, it, it was broadcast on the evening of Boxing Day. The evening of Boxing Day. That's yeah. right. And most people were, you know, yes. getting over lunch. Yes, <laughs> quite. <laughs> not, in a, not, not in a ready state for, for <laughs> a complicated film about yes, wartime, no. wartime espionage. No, no. It was, a kind of, it, was, it, it was made for ITV. It was made by Granada. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it, it was kind of, you know, it didn't really, nobody really took, uh, took the responsibility mm -hmm. in actual fact to, make, to, to, to look at it and say, look, we must sh do this because it, you know, it has never been, I don't think it's ever been used in, in, in television. I don't think it's ever happened. It's only happened here. Right, it's not being repeated on television. No, mm. I don't think it is. This, I mean, this is going to be a great scandal, actually, that this piece of work is lying relatively little known, relatively neglected. Anyway, <coughs> we're going to see two clips from it. In the first sequence, you see uh, Michael Gambon as the MI5 man uh, tracking down Patricia Hodge and obviously becoming increasingly uh, involved in her life. And in the second sequence, in a cab, you see Patricia Hodge with Michael York. Uh, and indeed, Anna Carteret, uh, Mrs. Morahan, is the third party in that scene. So can we see these two scenes from the heat of the day? What's impressive, particularly in that second sequence, is the evocation of wartime London. I know. <coughs> Harold and I were the only two people who actually understood that uh, the lights were turned out. <laughs> because of your generation? Yes, yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. Uh -huh. You know, and we, you know, it's, it's extraordinary, in fact. But technically, I mean, shooting in that, how difficult was it shooting with that degree of darkness? Oh, it? it was quite difficult, quite difficult, but quite a lot of it was actually done in, shall we say, in a, mo a still uh, set, you know what I mean? You yes. Know, we, we weren't in the street the whole time. No, no, right. No. But there was uh, just, uh, just that wonderful sense of London sort of, I don't know, shadowed in the blackout and faces just coming out of the darkness at you, beautifully right. done. 
Uh, Harold? Harold Pinter? We haven't talked about Harold yet. What memories, when I say the words Harold Pinter, what memories come to your mind? He was a splendid man, a man of uh, immense uh, dignity and uh, a sense of what was right and wrong. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have worked with him over a number of plays. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you actually came to see the first time when I did the Caretaker. The Caretaker and the Mermaid with Leonard the Rossiter. Mermaid, that's yes, right, indeed. Yeah, that's, right. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I remember you wrote about it. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. He wrote about it rather nicely. I, no, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you worked with Harold, I mean, on stage, you worked with him on screen. You were also partners in an enterprise, am I right? That's right, yes. Shield, we, was it? Shield, Shield, yes, with the D David Mercer and uh, himself and myself. We made a, a company because we were actually we weren't very happy with what was happening, shall we say, across the board. We actually wanted to do things in the theatre. Mm -hmm. And so we did, and we, you know, we did a number of things at, at The Mermaid. Mm -hmm. And also um, a play by uh, at, at the one that in Piccadilly Circus. You oh know. yes, the Criterion. The Criterion. Flint. Flint. That's by right. David Mercer. Yes. That's right. By yes. David Mercer, as well. I mean, as a director, what was it like having Harold, presumably present quite often in the rehearsal room? Was it a source of help, encouragement? Oh yes, 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 definitely. Because I'm, I'm, I'm on another occasion. I did uh, Kerry Crabbe and myself, and actually I decided that um, his uh, play, The Dwarfs, in actual fact, was missed. The girl, he, he left out the girl. Yes, in the in the first version. In the first version. Yes. But we produced. Who's in the novel? That's in the, yes. But in the second version. Yes. We get to see the girl. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. So we thought it would be very good because it never had been done, and we did that uh, uh, together. It was very much, and that was a, he was very supportive. Yes, immensely supportive, and immense help to everybody. I like the word dignity. That's a very good word to describe Harold. There was a kind of I don't know erect dignity about him. Oh yes, yes, absolutely, yes. honourable, honourable. Yes, absolutely, and yes. very generous in my experience. Yes, think. absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so we're speeding through your career now. I'm sorry to go so fast, but uh, no, you no. became head of plays uh, for television at the BBC, and I mean, you did many things as head of place in the 1970s. One of them was to commission very audacious uh, new scripts by people like Jim Allen. But you also brought theatrical classics to the television screen. Now, that seems to be something of vital importance, which, again, does not happen now, does it? We do not see the best stage plays on television, or very rarely. You're yeah, talking about uh, A Month in the Country, for instance. Well, yes, plays like that, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Well, I mean, many other plays. But, I mean, was that a mission of yours, to bring the best of theatre? Well, that was, a, no, but it was also because that, uh, Cedric Messina, who had actually had received an awful lot of kick, kicks on his shins by for people who... Uh, didn't reckon him. In natural fact, was a most uh, a, a splendid producer, mm -hmm. you know, and, and very ambitious. Right. You know, to deal with uh, plays that, in actual fact, had a have a life, you know, elsewhere, you know, for the th in the theatre. And so we did. I did Uncle Vanya as well. You did. Well, we want to check off. We did. Uh, I'd like to talk about Platonov, which is a very early Chekhov play, which we're going that's to right. see a clip of in one moment. That's right. That's it. Platonov. That's right. Uh, this is a play about what a, a sort of uh, school teacher who lives in a s terrible state of sort of private chaos, doesn't he? Having yes. affairs right, left, and centre, yes. um, and in the end, sort of retreats to the schoolroom. He's a school teacher. He's a Don Juan school teacher, and he That's retreats right. to the schoolroom, doesn't he, to yes. hide away really from the right. pressure of all these converging affairs yes. and yes. all these outraged uh, husbands and fiancés. That's right. So we see a clip from uh, Platonov with Rex Harrison as the hero, hiding away, really, isn't he, from oh, yes. the outside world in a, a gyp state of... A gypsy man. A gypsy man, yes. That's right. Yes. So let's see Platonov. In a nutshell, Rex Harrison, great actor, reputedly difficult man, was he? No, no, not at, not at all. Not at I all. mean, directable? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, when I told him to hide inside the desk, he said, OK, that's, that's a good idea. So he uh -huh. went into it. You uh -huh. know, quite uh, went beyond your instructions. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. But uh, he was—he uh, was splendid. Really was. 
it was a uh, you know it's a great pleasure and you know I remember actors used to come uh, come in and get you know come a, a, an hour before their call because they wanted to see him working really yes. in their spare time as well. yes that's right of course, there's no finer could... tribute than that is there an actor no, no. taking his Absolutely. leisure time to watch another actor that's right gosh it, it all came about because he then he wanted uh, um, the BBC wanted to do a one act play by uh, by uh, his son, but uh, there was a t there was an awful row. <laughs> Rex and the son started arguing with each other, mm -hmm. and that was all cancelled because of one point. And then the next day, I phoned him up and said, "Why don't we do Platonov?" Aha! Uh -huh, right. Well, <laughs> very glad you did. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, this leads us on, I think, fairly organically to the fact that I mean, having had this brilliant career in television, you then uh, joined Peter Hall at the National Theatre in the 1970s, having been, as a head of plays for television. Uh, Peter Hall, in his diaries, welcomes you, rightly so, with open arms, and says of you, he's a master craftsman and knows the whole repertoire, and what it, which is a handsome tribute. And what is impressive is the, is the variety of the plays you directed for the National. I mean, you did new writing by people like Robert Bolt and Nigel Williams, but you also did classics of like Shakespeare, uh, Ibsen, a lot of Shaw, I notice. Now, do you have an affinity with the plays of Bernard Shaw? Yes, I do. I, I enjoy them immensely. I'm thinking Man and Superman is a superb play. Which you did at the National. That's right. And also The Philanderer is an also delightful play, very witty. And we had a marvellous cast. It was just terrific. It was, lo it was lovely. Why Shaw? Because it strikes me, I mean, I'm a Shavian too, but one's always having to defend Shaw against the detractors. What, why, what, what is it about Shaw that draws you? Because people don't, uh, well, why? I, I, I just find it very entertaining, vastly entertaining. Yes. You know, and I also think that, uh, I mean, I did stumble at, uh, at Chichester as well, you know, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy Shaw very much indeed. Mm -hmm. You, of course, at the National, when, I mean, it was in its sort of early stages on the South Bank, wasn't it? And it was a period of great creativity, but also great. Crisis, industrial crisis. Yes, well, uh, yes. Yeah, in fact, I mean, was it a difficult time? In other words? It was a difficult time. I mean, you know, the people that you've been working with suddenly went on strike, you know, and you know, then barracked you as you actually came to the, stra the stage door. Very strange. There was a sense that there, there was a, a movement at the RSC as well, mm -hmm. where people actually wanted to be able to take away from, shall we say, these the people who run these companies because they believed that they, the, the stagehands, etc., etc., had a better view of what we wanted to, what, what should be done. But fortunately, it, that was uh, overtaken. I mean, I was uh, on the night, the first night when I did um, that Robert Bolt play about... Um, State of Revolution. State of Revolution. Yes. I was met by an assistant stage manager as uh, Anna and myself came into the stalls and you came up to us and said, the, the, the stage crew have gone on strike. And just for first night, and yes. they've, they've locked the prop cupboard. And, uh, and as I said to Anna, as we sat down, I said, they've locked the, what happens? We don't have any rifles. Because they, we, there yes. were quite a lot of rifles, because yes. it was a, about the war, as you might say. And what happened was that um, we had quite a tough lot of actors strong people yes. who went up to the to, to props and said, we're going to um, get that, we want to get those uh, guns in there. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, they said, and they, and they had big boots and they both, they kicked the door in. The actors? The actors did. Uh -huh. And brought, passed out rifles <laughs> like this <laughs> to the people, to the actors who were queuing up for it. Yes. Like something in, you know, in that lovely that film about the, uh, the one with the, the great, I can't remember, you know, a Soviet film about... Potemkin. Potemkin. Potemkin, Potemkin. 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 yes, uh, yeah, yes, that's, yes. Right. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Well, that's right. The, the, the steps, in etc. And there's a marvellous sequence there where the rifles are taken. Yes, As yes. the sailors are natural. About, and we, we, you know, it was marvellous. So the first night went on, yes. It, it went on. With rifles. That's right, yes, yeah. yes, and also... Uh, I mean, despite despite the industrial problems, did you have a happy time at the National? Did you feel yes, at ease there? Yes, immensely. Yes, and you got on obviously famously with Peter Hall. Yes, but also others. You know, I mean, you know, Bill Bryden was uh, ran a superb company uh, in the Cottesloe. 
really terrific, marvellous stuff. Yes. Very, very exciting indeed. It was a very lively time. I mean, the Peter w was, you know, uh, subjected to a great deal of um, really rather unpleasant uh, sort of propaganda. And he says, he, he said, the worst, one of the times when he actually felt rather depressed, his office was actually faced the river, mm -hmm. and a, a boat goes, went past with a man. He was actually saying, this is what is a big, you know, it came and made an attack on the National Theatre. Yeah. I was saying what a rotten place it was, and it was, Peter, uh, Peter Hall is in there, and because actually he heard, he heard himself being... Vilified by the man on the river. by the man in the boat. Yeah. He, said. he, he was, was very tough. Peter. Oh, yes, he was. Yeah, he, was a, he was a splendid man, Peter. Um, I think we uh, all should remember him. We do. Yes. Um, I mean, again, I'm sorry to rush you for your career, but um, we haven't, we've talked about television, we've talked about the theatre, and then there are films, feature films, and every director seems to be hungers to make feature films, and you've made several for the cinema. Um, I remember an early one, which you may not remember as clearly as I do, I don't know, called All Neat in Black Stockings. Oh, yes. Uh, which was about an amorous window cleaner, if my memory serves. That's right. You know, yes, uh, Victor, not, not Victor a Henry. Not a typical Moran subject, it seemed to me. <laughs> no, no, it was an idea of... Uh, of uh, of oh, oh, Hugh Whitemore. Hugh Whitemore. Yeah. That was right. That's right. But in the event, actually, I didn't enjoy making it. I found it a rather difficult time. I found that the cameraman was working a bit slowly and things of that nature. So I felt I wasn't as as happy as I'd hoped to be right. doing. Right. I suppose the film uh, by which you would probably choose to be remembered, rather than All Neat in Black Stockings, is Clockwise, which was, of course, written by Michael Frayn, one of those sort of archetypal Michael Frayn scripts. Uh, and for those who don't know it, it's about a, a, a harassed headmaster who is struggling against all the odds, isn't he, to cross the country to get to a headmaster's conference. Cars break down, etc., and he has to uh, camp out in a monastery for a while. Um, and then eventually he does arrive at the conference, doesn't he, the headmaster's mm. conference, somewhat dishevelled and the worse for wear. Um, before we talk about it, can we just see two clips from the film? The first sequence shows John Cleese as the headmaster on the road, and the second... Uh, scene shows him actually at the conference. So can we see uh, two clips, please, from Clockwise? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Classic frame, isn't it? It's about uh, chaos. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Invading yes. order. Yes, 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 yes. Um, making a feature film, I mean, is it... <clears throat> so, I mean, it worked a lot, obviously... Uh, films for television. Is it substantially different making a feature film or not? More arduous, less arduous? I don't know. Well, there's generally more at stake in when you're making feature films. You get more, shall we say, visits from uh, the producer and, uh -huh. uh, and other people coming. Yes. Uh, I find the informality of making films for television, in actual fact, more pleasing, particularly as it's becoming, you know, it's so much more sophisticated nowadays than it yes. used to be. Yes. So I, you know, I mean, I'm, there's something I want to do very, very, very much indeed, and and it's not something I would think of actually thinking of doing uh, for the cinema, but it would be a marvellous idea to do it in television, but I'm not going to say what it is. Oh, aren't you? No. Oh, oh not even the slightest hint? Not in the slightest. But your preference, <laughs> right, your preference would be to do it for television, because you imply... There is less um, overt interference. Is it? Yes, to a, to a certain extent. Though, when you're working for an independent company, you may find that uh, that they are more, you know, because I mean, I mean, most of the tough stuff we've seen here, in fact, are things that I have made for a television company. Yes, yes. Uh, there are not many of them. In actual fact, are to do with, uh, should we say, the private sector. No, right. And I prefer working with people who, in fact, who, who, who care very much about what you're trying to do, and not considering, uh, not being neurotic about, shall we say, the how, how, the, how the, uh, the overtime is going or not. Yes, whatever. what the rushes are like or whatever. Well, all that stuff. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So I, bef I, I like, I mean, enjoy television. I also like it very much, shall we say, socially, because it's marvellous. In a way, there's a feeling we actually, there are people there now. 
And I used to feel that when I was even doing Emergency War 10 or Zedcast. The sense is, you know, when you finished an episode of Zedcast, the phone would ring mm -hmm. and somebody would say, well, that was terrific, enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. People were actually out there listening at this time. Uh, and I just feel a little bit wary about sort of independent producers. I mean, again, speeding rather rapidly through your career, you've made some very fine films for television, one of which uh, was after Pilkington, of course, based on, uh, written by Simon Gray, one of your favourite writers. Yes. Um, that's a delight, isn't it? Black comedy, and oh, perfectly yes. poised between the sort of macabre and the farcical. No, oh, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, probably one of my favourites. Really? really? Because of its, uh, you know, I think the performances were extraordinary, and it's superb t text as well. Did, what was it about Simon Gray's work, basically, that you warmed to? Simon, Simon Gray as a writer, what was it about him that you liked? Oh, well, I liked it, his, uh, I liked very much, in a way, his humour and wit, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also he also cared hugely about how the film was being made. And he often, and you know, with Ken Trodd and I worked a number of times, but he actually wanted to cut or change things after after we'd made the film. Mm -hmm. But in a way, he he kept his, uh, you know, his, he had his hand on it until, in actual fact, it was actually ready for transmission. I remember one occasion when we just said, "Okay, well, that's it," and. Uh, and uh, Simon said, no, I wait a second. I'm just not quite sure we should do this. I'd like to try and cut about half a page, mm -hmm. you know, from something which is you know, after the dub and things of that nature. And uh, the editor was very upset about that. I said, no, I think it's quite easy. It's quite easy to do it. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants. Yes. That's right. And he's the writer. So Ken Trod and I, in actual fact, were able to carry that, you know, and so it was Simon, you know, because he, he was... Uh, he, he, he was very, very gifted in terms of being able to be his own critic. That's a very good point. Yes. Um, I'm sorry to rush on, but I mean, we haven't yet talked, so we must now talk about The Jewel in the Crown, which many of the audience here will have seen uh, on the big screen uh, early this evening, the first episode. Um, I mean, it was astonishing, I thought, to see it, was it not, on the big screen? The epic breadth of it came across in a way that um, it couldn't even on television, and it looked superb, I thought, on, on, the, on that screen. Um, what, again, I keep coming back to this, what is amazing now is the ambition, the scale of the enterprise. The thing that struck me watching it this afternoon also was the, the idea the story has room to breathe, the relative, you know, it, it, it was never slow, but the relative sort of, um, the, the gentle pacing of it, it, it goes at its own natural level. Today, everything on television seems to be go wham, bam, you know, it's incredibly yeah, fast. Sure. I mean, again, was that something you delighted in when you were making it? Oh, yes, yes. The spaciousness. Yes, yes absolutely. It, wanted, it, it, it was a, a, a marvellous experience. And also, it was interesting because, uh, I mean, there were two directors. There was a... Jim O'Brien. Jim O'Brien, yes. who died, I'm very sorry to say, about three years ago. And, uh, and myself, and it was uh, marvellous sharing that with him. Yes. You know, it was uh, very pleasing, you know, so that in a way, it, 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 because we had two directors, in a way that we were able to not rest, as you might say, but nevertheless, it meant that we had time to think for ourselves. And when you went to Sir Dennis Foreman at Granada and said, this is going to cost, you, what, £6.5 million, pounds, did he go white at, in the face or not? No, not at all. No? No, 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 no. He said, well, we've got to get some money. <laughs> yes, and they did. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes, yes. yes. It was marvellous. It was really terrific. Um, the, I mean, it was shot on film, wasn't it, which you yes. insisted on? Yes. And obviously using extensive locations. I mean, I mean, was it logistically a difficult film to make? Well, we had to spend, I spent about uh, four months or five months in India planning it. Really, just looking at locations. Looking at locations, because we also had to deal with, make sure that we we were going to be because of their their moving, uh, you know, the rains and things like yes. that, the yes. hot the hot weather. We had to make sure that we came, you know, went to a place where we could we knew we could film. Yes. I mean, some of it was shot in Wales. Yes. And quite a lot of buildings were shot in round around Manchester, but nevertheless, it it was a. Uh, 
extremely satisfactory, very exciting, and I found but working in India, in actual fact, is sti really stimulating. I mean, you had a great cast, some of whom I know are in the audience tonight. You also had a great crew, didn't you? I mean, particularly your lighting cameraman, I know you wanted to mention. Oh, yes. Ray Good. Yes, I mean, he'd, he'd actually been, he'd photographed the, uh, uh, what's it, you know, the big, uh, one of the big country house, what's it? Brighthead. Brighthead, 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 yes. Brighthead, <laughs> Brighthead yes, he, he, was, he was very, very, very good. Very good indeed. I mean, is it, is it, I don't know, am I being nostalgic by talking about a golden age when we look back at, at the, say, the amplitude and the scale of that series? It couldn't happen now. Well, but it could happen. It doesn't happen. But why doesn't it? I mean, that's the question. Why doesn't it? Why doesn't it? I don't know. Um, to a certain extent, you know, the, the, the things that ITV has been doing in that large house. <laughs> yeah. You mean Downton? <laughs> I wouldn't compare it for a moment, I have to say, to Joy in the Crown. Yeah, sure. Well, yes, because it was, it was actually, I felt, repetitive, actually. Downton, yes, yes. Downton, really. Yes. But I'm, I'm not going to hear, not come here to, 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 to rubbish. No, we won't, we won't, we won't. Let us talk about your glories, and let us have one last clip, shall we? Uh, and this is from a film which actually is about a, you know, shows a return to India, doesn't it, to the subcontinent? Yes, that's right. And this is a film called uh, The Peacock Spring, film made for television. And very basically, it's about... Uh, a, a, a man in India who uh, has a Eurasian mistress and his daughter comes out from England and uh, immediately goes into a state of conflict with the uh, Eurasian mistress. I should quickly add uh, the two key actors you're about to see are both sitting in the auditorium, uh, Jenny Hall, who plays the Eurasian, and Hattie Moran, who plays the daughter. Uh, so here we are. Can we just see a scene, please, from The Peacock Spring? Thank you very much. How difficult, Christopher, was it to cast your own daughter? I'm afraid, quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we'd had a very, we'd had an uh, afternoon casting director uh, and a producer, and we'd seen a number of young girls, and uh, they were charming and delightful. And I said, actually, uh, my daughter could do as well as these girls. And they said, oh, really? Can we see her tomorrow? And she was at school. Yes. So I went home and uh, went to see her headmaster. Because I'd seen her do a good person at Setsuan at, uh, at school. Mm -hmm. And she'd been superb, superb as the, as the leading part. And I said, went to the headmaster the next morning and I said, look, I'd, I've got this possibility that my daughter would, might be asked to do a, a television film. And he said, oh, fine, yes, that'll be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, was, uh, she wasn't due for any exam. She was on a, you know, she, was, she went to Cambridge the next year. But uh, he agreed. Mm -hmm. It was a private school, yes. you know. Uh, so I went back, you know, and she decided to do it when she was asked to. It was marvellous. What, what a happy story. It was a, ha a very happy story, and she was yes. smashing. Good. And she hasn't done too badly since. No, 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 not too badly since. <laughs> Good. Um, we're coming towards the end. I'll open it uh, to the audience in one second. I, just, I mean, the, it seems to be the thread that's been running through our conversation the whole evening has been uh, rejoicing in what television was capable of doing once, you know, um, ambitious epic series, um, highly intelligent films, uh, theatrical classics on television, and you've been instrumental in making all that happen. I mean, do you look back? You must look back with a sort of pleasure to what has been achieved, what you achieved. Yeah, if it wasn't me, no, there are a whole number of people, you know, producers, mm -hmm. uh, really first-class producers. And we all lived, in a way, in little offices with our doors were open, so we actually popped in and out and talked about what, what we were doing. Mm -hmm. It was very open, and in a way, so that one was, uh, you know, we would call and go and see James McTaggart and see how he was and so on and so forth. He was doing a play for today or something like yes. that. Or, or Cedric, who was actually fact going to do... Uh, uh, I mean, I did, I went, for instance, uh, I suggested that they did the, um, the Ragged Trouser Philanthropist. Uh, and, uh, you know, in actual fact, I, uh, I was a bit wicked there because I knew the person who actually owned the rights was my father. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that was, that was OK. <laughs> that was all right. Yeah, it was fun. It was terrific. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, it was just very, very exciting. And the doors were open the whole time, you know, the people going in and out of each other. Yes. And they, in a way, it was a place which where a group of people, in a way, as a college, as you might say. That's a very interesting analogy, yes. This collegiate atmosphere that made great television possible. Yes, I think so, which is wonderful. And a number of very, very good uh, controllers. Yes. I mean, there was one, I mean, for instance, uh, ten, Ken Trott and I went to see... Uh, uh, the controller of BBC One uh, about uh, a play about the, shall we say, the the failure of the Labour Party to maintain, or shall we say, uh, to change England after the end of the First World War. Yes. Is this Days of Hope? Days of Hope. Yes. That's right. And um, Paul Fox he said, yes, yes. All right. It was, it, was, it was a bit late, you know, and he said, no, don't worry, do it. Yes. Do it. Absolutely. I'll give you the money. Uh, the next day, he resigned. <laughs> but he'd made the decision. He'd made the decision. And he stood by it. And <laughs> Hugh Weldon was livid. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> he said, why are you always doing films that you know, attack England, you know, and things like that? I said, but, no, it's very good. It's going to be very good. He said, you'll never have a repeat. And of course, it became, you know, it was yes. a considerable yes. hit. Yes. But he honoured the agreement, that's the point. Yes. 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 And that was uh, Ken Loach, and you know, who, who made it. And, and he, you know, a person like Ken Loach, in actual fact, was, you know, it was changing the way in which films were made. Of course. Television, you know, it was marvellous, very exciting. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, several members of the cast of The Jewel in the Crown are in the auditorium. And I thought it would be a nice gesture if they joined us, gave up on stage and joined us and just uh, talked briefly about the memories of during the game. So could we welcome Art Malik, Susan Woolridge and Geoffrey Beavers. are all here tonight. Thank you. Well, I looked very, I'll be as brief as possible, because uh, um, I looked at my diary, uh, which I kept when I was doing Jewel, and besides uh, meeting Christopher for the audition twice, I think, uh, and the first read to, the first time he features is on day three, when I'm standing on the tube station uh, going to work, and I look along an empty platform, and I think, oh my God, it's Christopher. And I'm very, very shy of this man who I admire so much. And I swivel uh, so as to have my back, and I suddenly hear, good morning. <laughs> I go, oh, good morning, Christopher, like this. And anyway, the train comes in, and we sit down, and you are extremely affable, not one word of which I hear, because I've smothered myself in my flatmate's perfume, which is absolutely horrible. <laughs> and I think, oh, God, he's going to recast me for my taste in scent. <laughs> um, all I want to say is, 30 years on, thank you for the greatest present of Daphne Manners. I couldn't have done it without you. You let me fly, and you kept me grounded. And it was the most extraordinary career uh, uh, experience, and you have been the gold standard by which I've judged directors since and found all of them wanting. <laughs> okay. I, I, I agree with everything she said. Um, he's an extraordinary man. I mean, anyone that's had the privilege to work with him knows that. What's extraordinary about him is, as we've noticed this evening, he doesn't say a lot. When I first met him to play this part, which I have to admit was around the time when people were still blacking up, and he was insistent that Harry would be played 
by somebody who was from the subcontinent. And that, to me, was wonderful. I was straight out of drama college. I mean, it was three or four years or whatever. And I remember going to see him my first time. And he said, well, what have you been doing? I said, well, I've just done a play at the um, Young Vic. He said, yes, I saw that. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> I said, um, it was a difficult play. He said, no, it wasn't difficult at all. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Would you like to read something? <laughs> yes, of course. I think you might have to come back. That was my first audition. <laughs> and you've given me my career. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting this. Um, uh, but I, do, I, I felt like, um, uh, like you that it was very... Uh, I felt very shy. I'd heard, I'd heard things about Christopher, and I was a bit scared, and I tended to avoid him. But I remember... But it was a wonderful experience. Um, I was only in a few episodes, uh, so I wasn't in the episode you saw. But I just remember the amaz his amazing accuracy... I remember him coming up as I was dressed in a military uniform. I remember him coming up and checking all the medals on my uniform to make absolutely sure that they were the right ones and knowing which ones were right and which ones weren't. And uh, yes, I was a bit scared at the time, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, but trem not now, no. And, and tremendously admiring of his work and all he's done. Amazing. Thank you all very much. I mean, I would just like to say personally thank you to Christopher for the amazing work uh, that we've seen tonight and for your contribution to British television and theatre and film and for being so kind as to talk to us about it so openly tonight. So thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure. So thank please, you. thank you. Thank you.